بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي يجيبني حين أناديه ويستر علي كل عورة وأنا أعصيه والصلاة والسلام على أنبياء الله جميعا وعلى سيدهم وخاتمهم حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين وعلى سيدنا ومولانا الإمام أمير المؤمنين وقائد الغر المحجلين علي بن أبي طالب عليه الصلاة والسلام اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا واجعلنا اللهم من أنصاره وأعوانه قال تعالى في كتابه الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن أراد الآخرة وسعى لها سعيها وهو مؤمن فأولئك كان سعيهم مشكورا كلا نمد هؤلاء وهؤلاء من عطاء ربك وما كان عطاء ربك محظورا صدق الله العلي العظيم This is the first night of a series of nights of devotion and dedication. Nights of prayers and supplication. Nights of communion and a private conversation with our Lord, with the Creator. And this, these nights are momentous, critical, vital, extremely important. These nights are decisive in our life. They are fateful. Our future from now on is going to be determined during these nights. God is going to make decisions for us in partnership with us about our fate and our destiny and our destination and our direction in this life. Our happiness in the next 365 days depends on our deeds and our intentions during these nights. The nights of Qadr, the nights of power, the nights of destiny and the nights of communication with the Lord. So please do not waste your time during these nights. Do not engage in gossip. Do not engage in hurting yourself and hurting others. If you want to discuss something, discuss your own fate. Discuss your own destination. Discuss your own situation. Let's not discuss the situation of the people. Today we have to be more concerned about our own selves before being concerned about our friends and our neighbors. Tonight, waste no time in remembering God, in strengthening your relationship with God, because it is only God that you need in this life. We are surrounded by family members, by good friends, community members. Many of them are loyal to us. Many of them are very good to us. But a time would come that your husband would not be able to help you. Your wife would not be able to help you. Your attorney and your neighbor and your cousin will not be able to help you. Only God would be able to help you. So please, let's 
foster a good relationship with God during these nights. Let's not waste these upcoming nights from tonight until the end of the month, the last 10, the last 10 nights of the holy month of Ramadan. Let's spend these nights in adoration. Let's spend these nights in good deeds. Try tonight, from tonight until the end of the month, not to hurt anyone around you, neither verbal nor physical. Do not hurt people. Do not offend them. Neither hurt yourself. Anything that comes out of your mouth during these last 10 nights should be good and pleasant and wholesome. Avoid backbiting. Avoid slandering people. Avoid speaking behind them. Avoid accusation. Avoid being rude. Try to be kind. These are the recipients for success. These items God wants to see in your behavior, in your life during these nights. God is extremely generous. And God, his resources never end. It has no end. They are unlimited. But then God would not give something for someone who does not deserve. He doesn't give. In this night, this night is called the night of taqdeer. We have three nights of Qadr. They are divided into three categories. This night, the eve of the 19th, is called the night of taqdeer. Taqdeer in Arabic means assessment, evaluation. God is going to evaluate our conditions. He is going to evaluate our manners. How much we are worth in the market today. Are we worth a lot because of our good deeds and good intentions? Or are we worth nothing because we only hurt people? It depends on you. You can give the answer. It depends on where you stand from God. How far you stand from God. How far you stand from your community and your family. How far you stand from your values and principles. It all depends. These things are being considered by God. He looks at your heart first. He looks at your intentions. He looks at your deeds. He looks at your relationships with your parents, with your family members, with your neighbors, with your co-workers. He considered these things. He considered them. He's grading us. God tonight is grading us from a scale of 1 to 10 to see where we stand, how much value we carry, how much merits and worth we have. Nothing is free. God says, I'm not going to give even one inch of paradise to someone who does not deserve it. You must deserve that. You must work hard for it. In Surah Yasin, you get what you work for, what you strive for, what you struggle for. So let's not waste our time and our energy. Let's really focus. Many people, they seek change. And change does not come free. We have to work hard to change ourselves. We have to have will. We have to have a strong will. Without strong will, we cannot succeed. Without sacrificing for the sake of transformation, we cannot succeed. We need to sacrifice. We need to give up on something or on a few things that are bad. We are doing it. We are practicing it. They are bad. We must stop them. If we continue to do these bad things, carry bad thoughts, bad heart, bad intentions, bad relationships, God is not going to find us worthy of his blessings and his bounties and his gifts and his forgiveness. We must begin the first step. We must take the initiative. And believe me, when God looks at you being serious, being honest, 
being hard working, trying to change yourself with full seriousness, he will help you and he will guide you and he will embrace you. Because this God is the God of mercy. You know, God is different from us. How he is different? We do not decide our destiny. God is the one who decides our destiny, but, but in partnership with us, not in isolation from us. God is going to decide how much I am going to receive, how much I am going to get, what will happen to me, what will happen to my health, what will happen to my future, what will happen to my job, to my family, when I am going to die. These things he decides them for us. But out of wisdom, not arbitration. Whenever we give, we give with strict, strict and wise measurement, qadr. Not arbitration, not discrimination. When God gives, he gives what you deserve. However, God decide nobody decides his destiny for him he is the only one he's the sovereign he's the sovereign nobody can decide for god what to do but god says one thing i made it incumbent upon me mandatory upon me and that is mercy bestow my mercy on the people kataba rabbukum ala nafsihi rahma God is free. Nobody can force him to do anything. God is independent from any force, from any influence. But he said, me who is completely independent, I myself, I made it mandatory upon you. I can't get away with that. Mandatory upon myself to bestow mercy on my people, on mankind. كَتَبَ رَبُّكُمْ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ الرَّحْمَةِ so when you do good, he must reward you. He must reward you. He says, I made it must upon me to reward you. So don't lose this opportunity. These nights, I have a friend, American friend, who said, what is the meaning of these nights? I said, there are two meanings in these Layali al-Qadr, the nights of destiny, the nights of fate, the night of destination, destination. One meaning, we get closer to God because definitely we want to be happy. We don't want to be miserable. We want something, we do not want something bad and terrible to happen to us and our children and our family members. We seek happiness, we seek prosperity. This is number one. So we need to get close to him. And the closer you get to him, the more tolerant, patient, and happy you become. Even if you lose something, you would not freak out. That is the difference between a believer and non-believer. Some people think that when you start practicing religion, nothing will happen to you. Your car is going to be fine. Your house is going to be fine. Your health is going to be fine. Your children are going to be fine. No. No. Because the prophets and messengers and the good people, every tragedy happened in their life. Every tragedy. So what is then the difference between a believer and non-believer? The believer has a power to observe a power to stand, withstand these tragedies. A power and energy to take them and tolerate them, not to collapse. Therefore, God says, the true believers, when something happens to them, what do they say? The first thing they say, الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ This is... This is the statement that we say. We say that I come from God and definitely I have to go back to him. There is no escape. 
This is how they counsel and console themselves. This is how they bring peace to their life. So they don't collapse. While the non-believer, they collapse. They take out their life. They kill themselves. They kill their family members. But believers, they have hope in God, in His mercy. They say whatever He chooses for us, we accept. We accept because we know this God is the God of mercy and love. He's not the God of revenge and punishment. What He intends for me is good for me. Even if I look at it from my narrow window, narrow angle that this is bad, but He looks at it from all angles, from all windows. And he says, this is good for you. This night is the night of assessment. Tomorrow, on, on Thursday, after tomorrow, it's the night of Ibram. Ibram is ratification. Ibram is confirmation. Whatever God is going to assess for us tonight is going to be confirmed in two nights. And then after that, another two nights after that, on Saturday, which is the grand night of Qadr, Saturday, the eve of the 23rd, it's the night of endorsement. It's night of the sign and the seal, the night of Imda, the signature. Final signature of God is going to be put on your destiny, on your life, on your file, on that night. But these nights are vital. In preparation for the signature, you have to work harder. You have to make good intention. You have to do good deeds. You have to purify your intention, your niyyah. You have, as you said, as you heard earlier, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu attaqu allaha wa kunu ma'as sadiqeen. It is not a coincidence that Ali ibn Abi Talib is martyred during these nights. This is a signal from God. A signal, an indication from God. He wants you to be pure in these nights. He wants you to be honest. He wants you to speak the truth. He wants, to be, he wants you to be an integrated person. So if you sometimes get confused and say, who should I follow? My father is not the best. My uncle is not the best. I know them. My husband is not the best. My wife is not the best. My brother is not the best. So you get confused. God says, I'll provide you with the best example. That example is Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu And Ali is the best because he is the servant, the servant, the servant of a Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is how we look at Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali is great because he was a good student a good follower, a good disciple of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the messenger of God. He was the closest to him. He was his right arm. He was his first defender. And whatever I say about Ali is not enough. I said many times, when I prepare a lecture to speak about Ali, I get confused. Where should I start? Where? What aspect of his life? I'm enchanted with this man. I'm crazy about Ali ibn Abi Talib. And you know Ali, his community, they did not do justice to him. They did not appreciate him. Neither they understood him. Neither they valued him. His community abused him. They misunderstood Ali. They didn't give him what he deserves. So Ali was mazloom. Ali was abused. And even today, Many Muslims do not know Ali ibn Abi Talib. They don't know his value. They don't know his contribution. They don't know if there is a mosque today anywhere on this earth. It is due to the bravery and the sacrifice of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu wassalam. It is for his sacrifice. And this is why the first equality of Ali I'll speak about three qualities briefly. The first quality is tadhiyah, sacrifice. Tadhiyah and sacrifice, fidakari. Ali ibn Abi Talib, when he was young, 12 years old, he decided out of conscience and out of choice and out of understanding 
to go with his cousin, first cousin Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Into the dangerous streets of Mecca. The streets of Mecca were hostile to the Prophet, were dangerous. They attacked the Prophet, they insulted the Prophet. And Ali was a child, 12 years old. His mother did not say to him, listen, boy, come here, sit at home. This is not your work. No. Neither his mother said this to him. His father already passed away, Abu Talib, when they were in Mecca. And he knew that this is his duty. Even if these territories and these neighborhoods are dangerous, I must go and defend my cousin. Not because Muhammad is my cousin, but because Muhammad is Rasulullah, the messenger of God. So he decided to go into the streets of Mecca. Do you know of some cities, some neighborhoods that are very dangerous? We have in this nation, we have some neighborhoods that are very dangerous. Mecca to the Prophet at that time was very dangerous. He had no friend. The environment were very hostile. Why? Because the Prophet was defying and challenging their principles. Principles that is based on materialism, based on falsehood, based on aggression, on aggression. I'll give you an example of the Meccans. The Meccans were ready to do anything and everything just to stay in power, to be the leaders of the society, just like some countries today. They sign contract $500 billion with some countries to purchase weapon just to stay in power just to maintain their seat. The story is repeating itself 1400 years ago. We have the same story. They were fighting the Prophet, not because the Prophet was a bad man. The Prophet was inviting them to be good, to be good children, good husbands, good wives, good neighbors, good citizens. But because the Prophet was stripping them of their influence, of their aggression, of their dominance. They wanted to dominate the region with their aggression, with their theft, with their robbery. They wanted to keep this gap between them who were extremely rich and the rest of the society which was poor. This is why they did not like the Prophet. They did not respond to his, invita his invitation. They called him liar. They called him deceiving. They called him Sahir, a sorcerer, the only one who said, I'm going to defend you, Ya Rasulullah, despite my young age, but I have big heart. Don't look at my hands. My hands are small. My body is small. Look at my heart and my will. Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi salatu wassalam. He was with the Prophet, like a shadow. No day the Prophet leaves his house, but Ali is next to him, next to him, defending him. Chasing those kids. The kids who throw stones at the Prophet Ali would run after them to defend his cousin. Ali was a symbol of sacrifice. Ali is the only man, of course, he learned that from the Prophet. And the rest of the Imams learned that from their grandfather, the Prophet was a man who did not work for himself. Today we, and when I say we, we all, leaders, lay person, others, religious leaders, political leaders, we work, the majority of us, we work for ourselves. We put ourselves before our societies. Ali did not work for himself from day one. Ali never worked for himself, never worked for his fame for his wealth for his position for his influence he put the society first he always says people before me even the day he accepted leadership the khilafah in the year 60 in the year 35 hijri even that year when he accepted the khilafah he accepted it to help the people and save them and guide them because the muslim ummah was in disarray 
The Muslim Ummah was completely dismantled. If you read the history of Islam, year 35 was a disastrous year in the history of Islam after the murder of the third Caliph, Uthman. The Muslim Ummah was in disarray. Ali got elected, put pressure on him by the people. They came to him, they said, Ya Ali, there is no one to save this Ummah but you. He accepted that just to save the Ummah, the community, not himself. Ali didn't need to be a leader. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, one of the greatest Sunni scholars in Islam, the leader of the Hanbali sect. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal says, Inna Aliyan, Inna Aliyan, Lam tazunhu al khilafa walakinnahu zanaha. The only man who became khil, Caliph, Amir al Mu'mineen, and the Khilafa did not give him a credit. He was the one who gave it a credit. He was the one who gave the Khilafa value. Sometimes someone gets to the office, nobody knows him. Once he gets to the office, he becomes popular, he becomes influential, he becomes wealthy. Ali was already influential in the eyes of God. Ali was popular in the hearts of the angels, in the eyes of the angels. Ali was not seeking popularity, neither wealth. Ali became more poor when he became caliph. Before he became caliph, he had some money. He could spend some money on himself and his family. The day he became caliph, he confined himself, he restricted himself to life, to life of poverty. And he, when, when he was asked why the house of a treasury is full of money, full of gold and jewelry, why you deprive yourself from food? Why do you deprive yourself from clothing? Why you deprive yourself from a, a, a nice house? He said, because I have to be equal to the least in my community. To the least people in my community. I can't eat food. I can't enjoy food. Ali was a person who would not enjoy food when there is someone even far away. Ali was in Kufa. Between him and Hijaz, 1,500 miles. Between him and Yamama, Yemen, another probably 1,200 miles. He would say, I would not enjoy my meal if I eat a meal, fresh meal, healthy meal, while someone, a family, a child, a widow, an orphan is starving thousands of miles away from me. I would not enjoy that meal. Take it away. Even tonight. Tonight, on the eve of 19th, in about a few hours from now, in about four or five hours, he's going to be struck by the sword of Ibn Muljam. That night, his stomach was empty, although he was fasting the whole day. The stomach was empty. When he were about to break his fast, his daughter says, I brought him a meal. He said, remove the meal. He took only one loaf of barley bread, non a joe. Khubz al-Sha'ir, barley bread only. That was the meal of the greatest man in the nation, the Caliph, who had the Baytul Mal treasury at his disposal, but he didn't touch it. And he would say to the money, he would look at money. Baytul Mal would get filled with taxation and money. And he looks at the money and he says, Ya dunya ghurri ghayri. O oh, dunya, O oh, material, O oh, money, O oh, gold and silver, deceive someone else. You cannot deceive me. I'm not going to be deceived when I look at gold and silver. This is Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali ibn Abi Talib had a class, earnestness. And I oftentimes I say, people during his time abused him, and we are also abusing him now. Do you know how we abuse Ali? We abuse him when we claim we are the Shia of Ali, but we do not represent his values. We do not follow his example. We claim that we love him, we adore him, we mention him, we name our children after him, but we do not follow his example. Ali says, I'm not asking you to withdraw yourself from this life. Use this life, but do not let this life uses you. 
And he says, do not let this life control you. The difference between someone who is wealthy and a believer, and someone who is a wealthy but non-believer, the difference is not one of them practices the prayers, the other does not practice. Neither the difference is one of them does fast, the second doesn't fast. No. That is not the measurement of religiosity. Some people think if someone prays, he's religious. If he doesn't pray, he's not religious. No. No. This is wrong. The difference is that someone who's wealthy and religious does not let his wealth control him. While the one who's religious, while someone who's wealthy and non-religious, he gives in to the temptation of his wealth. He allows his wealth to control him, rather than him controlling wealth. And this is mentioned in this book, in the Quran. God says the real religious person is the one who detaches himself or herself from this dunya. The one who shares, even without you tell him, he knows his responsibility. He comes forward. I know some people in the community, when the month of Ramadan comes, they come to the mosque, they say, you search for someone who's needy, give him this assistance, give him this money. And there are other people who come to the mosque, they pray, they fast 30 days, they never give one penny, one single penny. That's the difference. And this night, we have to reflect on these ideals. We have to reflect, it, it, it's the night of self-examination and self-reflection on our life. Where do we stand? Where do I stand? Let me ask myself, am I really religious? Am I really following Ali ibn Abi Talib? Am I really following this book? I don't have someone to answer me. I can answer myself. I can examine myself and answer myself. Look at yourself where you stand. When there is a worthy cause, are you there to help or you turn your face and you run away? You can answer that question. Ali was the one, wherever there is a need, is the first one to be there. Ali exhausted himself. Ali Khilafa was not a privilege for him. The only man who became caliph and the Khilafa was a burden on him was Ali ibn Abi Talib Because during the Khilafa he lost his health. He lost his rest. He would not rest, he would not eat, he would work 24 hours a day. He would feel the sense of responsibility while others before him and after him, they didn't live up to that responsibility. People who came after him, they wasted, they plundered the wealth of the nation. They created the gap, economic disparity. They created an atmosphere of hate rather than unifying the community, the ummah, they created hate and a grudge in the hearts of men and women. And Islam lets, lost its value. Islam was, the community was Muslim by name, not by character, like many communities today. Many communities are Muslims just by the name tag. They carry a name tag, I'm a Muslim. But the character is something else. We learn from Ali, alayhi salatu wasalam, devotion. And also, we learn from him muasat, sympathy. In this month of Ramadan, if we don't have sympathy with others, there is something wrong with our fasting. Believe me. Believe me. Believe me if you don't have sense of sympathy and understanding and compassion for the needy, for the orphans, for people in your community and outside your community, for those who are suffering, then your fasting has a problem. It's not running well. This is not the fasting that God loves. Our Imam says God prescribed fasting for many reasons. One of them, one of them, so you get hungry, so you feel the pain of those who, who go the whole year without food. This is one reason why we fast. Because throughout the year, the cup of coffee is next to me. I take two meals, three meals, five meals, 
pastry, fruits. And I, we don't feel the hunger. You don't get hungry. God wants you now to be hungry for a few hours, 16 hours, in some countries 18 hours, so you feel how others feel. So you sympathize with them. And this is embedded in our book. Sympathy is in this book. Sympathy is a cornerstone of this Holy Quran. لَن تَلَالُوا الْبِرُّ لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ you would not be religious and pious and righteous unless you give from what you love. You give it from the bottom of your heart. When you give, you have to say to that who receives, tell him, thank you for accepting my donation. You tell him, thank you. This is giving with love. And this is a model that Ali ibn Abi Talib and his wife Fatima to Zahra. I mentioned this story some time ago here. They raised, you, you think Imam Hussein just gave his life because he came from vacuum? He just like was, he, he was like other kids in the community running with them and all of a sudden he decided I give my life for the sake of God? No. His parents were working on him day and night, day and night preparing him for this task. They were nurturing him. They were nurturing in him, in him, the spirit of sacrifice, the spirit of giving, the spirit of generosity, the spirit of sim sympathy. They prepared him. And I mentioned this story. The day that they were fasting. And you know now in Ramadan, when you fast, how you feel at 5 p.m. and 6 p.m. and 7 p.m. And if you have kids at home fasting with you, kids who are 10 years old, sometimes less than 10 years old, Hassan and Hussein, Zainab and Kulthum, they were four, five, six, seven years old. Hassan was seven, Hussein was six, Zainab was five, Um Kulthum was four. Their parents were fasting and they were about to bring them the food and all of a sudden at the time were they about to eat and what sort of food was only a loaf of bread for every person? No more than that. Not a three-course meal. A loaf of bread. Someone knocks at the door. God is training them. God is doing this in purpose. God is creating in them sense of giving and sacrifice when they are kids. Hussein could not be able to give his life and his blood at the age of 58 if he had not given his loaf of bread at the age of six to the poor and the needy. Someone knocks at the door and the mother comes and takes all the bread and she says, there is someone hungry out there. Let's give them the food. And they agree. The kids, they are not upset. The kid says, yes, mom, of course. We give it to someone else. And this, this, Incident takes place in three days, three consecutive days, three days, my friends, until their life was in danger. Those kids, they were about to die. They passed out. The Prophet came and noticed what happened. And Allah sends a whole chapter celebrating this event. When you have time, read this chapter. Chapter six, chapter 76, Surah Tul, what Surah? Al-Insan. And God names this chapter Al-Insan. This is a humanity. He calls this event humanity. This is real humanity. Al-Insan. وَيُطْعِمُونَ الطَّعَامَ عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ مِسْكِينًا وَيَتِيمًا وَأَسِيرًا إِنَّمَا نُطْعِمُكُمْ لِوَجْهِ اللَّهِ لَا نُرِيدُ مِنْكُمْ جَزَاءً وَلَا شُكُورًا That incident prompted the day of Ashura, where Hussein stands and gives his blood and the blood of his children and family members and companions. We have to prepare our children. We have to instill in them the spirit of giving, the spirit of generosity. When someone is mean and he does not give, he's doing double tragedies, not just he's hurting himself, he becomes a bad example for his family too, for his children too. Not only he's hurting himself, he's going to hurt his children too. 
because he is giving them bad example. When a father or a mother tells her son, her daughter, don't give, don't donate, she is or he is not only hurting himself, but he's hurting his children. While if a father tells his son, Mashallah, my son, I am proud of you. I am proud of you. You are donating. You are helping. You are feeding. You are sacrificing. You are working. You are giving your food to others. You are giving shelter to others. I am proud of you. He is going, that person is going to reap the benefit and also his family and his children. He is preparing them for the future. He is preparing them. He is drawing Every father wants to build a good house for his children. Isn't it that? Don't you want to have a good house for your children? I advise you one thing. Not only build them a good house in this life, try to build a good house for them in the hereafter too. By instilling good values in them. Preparing them to succeed into the next chapter of their life. Which is the real life. al hayatul akhirah The hereafter. Tonight, Amir al-Mu'mineen would spend the nights of Ramadan after the death of his wife Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam at a young age. He was remarried of course, but he would spend time with his children too. He would not leave his children behind. So he decided to spend nights of Ramadan every night he would go to one of the houses of his children. One night at the house of Imam Hassan, he would break. And the house at that time was a room, a room, not a mansion. Ahlul Bayt were satisfied with a small, small homes here because they knew that these small homes are going to lead into bigger homes there. So they were not enchanted with this life. They knew that they are travelers in this life. They are temporary residents in this life. So they saved what they had, their energy. They did not put all their energy and all their attention all, and all their concern on this life. We, we the people, are consumed with this life. We put all our energy on this house here. How to fix it? On my car, on my clothing, on my parties, on my dinners. Ahlul Bayt would put 2% of their energy here. 98% on the Akhir. And they made good investment. And this is why after Imam Ali was killed in the year 40, 40th Hijri. This year is 1,438. So how many years ago? 1,398 years ago. 1,398 years ago. You come here to commemorate his martyrdom. Would you do this to your own grandfather? If your father dies, would you gather after 10 years after his death? Would you gather after five years after your father's death, your mother's death? You don't do that. But you do this to Ali because Ali is real, your real father. And the Prophet said to Ali, Ya Ali, ana wa anta aba wa hadhi al ummah. Me and you are the real spiritual fathers of this ummah, the community. They treated the community with a sense of fatherhood, with a sense of compassion and mercy. Tonight was the turn of his fourth child, Um Kulthum. So he decided to go to her house to break his fast. He was the guest of his daughter, Um Kulthum. At the time of sunset, she brought him food. She put it on the table. He said, Ya Umm Kulthum, Mata ra'ayti abaki ya'kul. When did you find your father? You've been his daughter for so many years. Did you find me being enchanted with food, variety of food? You put variety of food in front of me? I don't like this. Do you want me to have a long standing before God on the day of judgment? Take the food. She took the food and only one loaf of barley bread was there with some salt. 
So Imam ate that one. He broke his fast. And he never wasted any minute tonight on the 9th of the 19th, of the eve of the 19th. Never. He spent the night in adoration and dua because he knew he received a signal, a signal, ishara from his beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 38 years before, 38 years before this night, when Ali was only 25 years old, the Prophet turns to him and he says, Ya Ali, I feel sorry for you. The, Ali says, Why Ya Rasulullah do you feel sorry for me? I'm happy. He said, I know you are happy now. But during this month of Ramadan, during the month of Ramadan, while you are standing in your sanctuary, in your mihrab, offering your Lord some units of prayers, a wicked person strikes you on the head and he drenches you with your blood and he kills you. So Ali, rather than freaking out and saying, why this happens to me? He said, he smiled. He said, Ya Rasulullah, wa dhalika fi salamatin min dini. My faith is intact my faith is strong the prophet says definitely ya ali fi wa dhalika fi salamatin min dinik your faith is the strongest at the time of your martyrdom don't worry about your faith from that day 38 years before his martyrdom ali would always say mata yub'athu ashqaha when does that man comes to drench my beard from the blood of my, my head? He was waiting that, for that moment of departure, the moment of shahada. Ali was never afraid of death. Ali was the one who was very young at the age of 22. He sleeps in the bed of the Prophet knowing that Quraysh are going to attack the house and the bed and murder the Prophet that night. And this is recorded in the second chapter in this book. He wasn't, he was not afraid of death. He welcomed death because death for Ali is salvation. For Ali ibn Abi Talib, Death is Allah going back to his Lord. Ya ayyatuhan nafsul mutma'inna turji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan mardiyya fadkhuli fi ibadi wadkhuli jannati. I love you, ya Amir al-Mu'mineen. I love you, ya Ali ibn Abi Talib. You are a man that we did not do justice to you. We still cannot comprehend you. We still cannot appreciate what you did for us. It is because of your bravery we are worshipping God today. Because you defended Islam. When Islam was gharib, alone. When the Prophet was alone. You were with him, defending him. Because you, Ali, you were the one who took our hands. And you showed us the way to God. How to reach God. How to be noble. How to work for our Akhirah. How to carry the spirit of selflessness. Selflessness. How to put others before ourselves. And tonight you are going back to your Lord, Ya Ali. Tonight is the night of the fatal injury of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Where? Where? Inside Masjid al-Kufa. His journey started from a masjid and ended in another masjid. Ali was born inside the Kaaba, the Grand Masjid, the house of God in Mecca, and tonight his life ends in another house of God in the city of Kufa. Tonight, look at the design of God. Ali spent the night in dua, in prayers, in istighfar, and once in a while he goes outside and he looks at the stars and he comes back and he says, Wallahi hiya hiya al-laylatu allati wa'adani fiha habibi rasulullah. It is, it is the night. 
Certainly this is the night that I have been promised by my sweetheart, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is the night of my departure. I can tell, Wallahi ma kathibtu wa la kuthibt. I never lied in my life. Neither my sweetheart, the Prophet, lied to me. It is the night. This is the night of my departure. So he spent the night in Ibadah. Before Fajr, before dawn, Ali ibn Abi Talib stood and between his house and the masjid, maybe 20 steps, no more. For those of you who have been to Kufa, you can see his house. And there is a path that takes him right from his house, right into the masjid. Maybe 20 steps, 30 steps, no more than that. He got prepared and he was putting his dress on and he was speaking to himself. Wrap your waistband, Hayazimak. Prepare, put on the dress and go, go for the reception of the death because death is coming to you. Do not worry. Do not be afraid of death when death lands into your courtyard because in death there is salvation. There is victory for Ali. And then he left his house. Every night, Hassan and Hussein, they surround their dad to go to the masjid. But tonight, look at the design of God. God wants Ali to be alone tonight without any bodyguards, without his sons, nobody with him. He goes alone to the masjid because the design, the work of God is in a progress. God wants Ali to come back to him tonight. So he goes to the masjid. The masjid is empty before Fajr, Masjid al-Kufa. Still people have not arrived. But there was a man laying on his, on his belly, and that was Ibn Muljam. And Ali knew that this is his arch enemy. Ali knew that this is his murderer because the Prophet told him, who's going to kill you, Ya Ali, on that night of the month of Ramadan. Ali came to him with a nice tone in a very gentle way. He said to him, Ya Ibn Muljam, do not, innaha nawmatu shayateen, do not sleep on your belly. This is the way that Satan's sleep. This is not good. Why he was sleeping on his belly? Because he was hiding the sword that he wanted to kill Imam Ali with it. So Imam Ali never said to him, you're going to murder me. He just said to him nicely, do not sleep this way. This is not good. And Imam Ali went into his mihrab to offer the nafila of Fajr. Before Salatul Fajr, there are the prayers of nafila. Before the Adhan, he was standing in his mahrab. And once Ali goes into his prayers, he pays attention to nothing but his Lord. He would put all his energy, all his focus on remembering and speaking to his Lord. When Imam Ali started before the prayers started the Adhan, that night, Ali ibn Abi Talib himself, he did the Adhan. Although there is a Mu'adhin in Kufa, a Mu'adhin who raises the Adhan, but the design of God is for Ali to raise the Adhan. Why? So the people of Kufa, they hear the voice, the beautiful voice of Ali ibn Abi Talib. So he went to the pulpit, the member, and he raised his voice, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah. The voice of Ali reverberated in the entire city of Kufa. The city of Kufa is big. Jurist, uh, historian says, فَمَا كَانَ بَيْتٌ فِي الْكُوفَ إِلَّا وَدَخَلَهُ صَوْتُ الْإِمَامِ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ there is no single house in the city of Kufa and the surroundings, but the voice of Ali penetrated that house and the entire population of Kufa were able to hear the last Adhan of their Imam, Ali ibn Abi Talib. And then when the Adhan was concluded, Ali comes down to his mihrab, Ya Mu'mineen, 
he stands, he says Allahu Akbar for his prayers. He goes to Ruku' and when he goes to Sujood, Ibn Muljam who was hiding behind the column, he raises his sword and he strikes at the head of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu was salam. When Amir al-Mu'mineen received received the strike, what did he say? He said, Fuzdu wa rabbil ka'ba. Fuzdu wa rabbil ka'ba. Qatalani al-rajul. Thumma sami'u sarikhan bayna al-sama'i wal-ard. An angel was crying between the heaven and earth. Ala, ala, tahaddamat. Wallah, arkanu al-huda. Tahaddamat, the, the foundations of faith has been dismantled now. Wanfasamat al urwatul wuthqa, the handle of faith is disconnected now. Qutila aliyun al murtada, qatalahu ashqa al ashqiya. Aliyun al murtada, the cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has murdered. He has been murdered by the most wicked. At that time, Hassan and Hussein, they heard this voice. They rushed to their father, alayhi salam, Amir al muminin They found him in his mihrab, his face down. He was in a pool of blood, drenching his blood. They carried the father to the house. فتهدمت والله أركان السماء اليوم ما أتى الأنبياء جميعا لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين